cap a little bit with the wrestling is the low man wins. Yeah. Keep lowering yourself. Keep, keep positioning yourself in this humble way and let the Lord exalt you at his proper time. Yeah. We walk these things out rightly and we apply them to our life. They'll do great and mighty works. The, the Lord God himself will do great and mighty works Amen. through your life surrendered. Amen. And that's not to make you feel good. Though I like to make you feel good. But it's not to make you feel good because what it's going to cost you is your whole life. You're going to have to die in order to make that happen. So it's a little bit of a catch there. It sounds good. sounds glorious. But you're going to have to give your life for it. Yeah. Spiritually speaking, and maybe one day we'll be honored to physically lay our lives down as martyrs for the King of Kings. Yeah. The last Sunday was no exception to the words that we've been given. This was a mighty and weighty word. Brother Oscar, Brother Oscar brought a timely word for this family. And we're applying it to our life. And we're watching it impact us forever. Because we're watching it impact our generation. Amen. Right? Amen. We're saying that again to the young men. Arise and eat, young men. Your eyes are focused upon the men ahead of you. And you will arise and you will eat. And because of that, you will be impacted. There will be a transfer of impact into your lives as you watch these men and women sacrifice and live a life for the King of Kings. Amen. The objective for us this morning is to stir up a desire. Amen. It's to stir up new perspectives, just like Pastor Zeke did with the scripture he read and declared to us. It's to change our perspectives a little bit. Help us see this in a new light, a new way that maybe will challenge and correct some. And maybe it will stir uh, and, and stir others to jealousy for some. Some it will just empower. You're already right. The fuel's already ready. This oil is already being poured over you. It'll be an encouragement. Wherever this word hits you, we're going to really pray for a response Amen. at the end of this service. Amen. We're going to be praying for a response, Amen. a right and correct response for us this morning. Amen. So we're looking to stir that desire and perspective as we eat and we drink. This requires us to arise to do this daily. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning. Again, it's a delight to be here with you today and to be able to do this with my pastor, Sam. It's, yeah. it's, it's a joy to be here. Amen. Um, last week, we dove into Elijah, didn't we? Yeah. Amen. Um, are you satisfied or do you want more? More! Because there's more there. There's more for us. There's more the Lord wants to show us and give us. And so, before we dive into it again and continue looking at to what else the Lord will show us through the life of Elijah, I want you all to say after me. I am arising, I am arising, arising and, I'm eating. and I'm eating. Hallelujah. Amen. And so last week, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a recap of where we are, what the setting is in the scripture. We began in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, yep. right, where Ahab is king in Samaria and he's married a foreign idolater wife known as Jezebel. He did more to provoke the Lord to anger than any of the kings before him. We heard these things yesterday, yeah. no, sorry, last week. I want us to hear them again yeah. so we can invest ourselves into this narrative, yeah. into the words of God. This, this is not just a, a story. This is, this is real <coughs> life. This happened. Yeah. I sometimes nice. I just have to remind myself of that. This actually happened. This is history. This is the word of God. Yeah. Amen. And so the prophets of God are being persecuted by Jezebel and Ahab. <laughs> Obadiah, the God-fearing servant, is hiding prophets by fifties in caves, and he's feeding them bread and water. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Elijah appears on the scene and declares that there will be no rain except by his word. This is when we arrive in 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to read some of those verses. Good. Yeah. In verse 3 he says, The Lord is telling Elijah, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. The Lord is telling Elijah this. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, and that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. I want to, point, I want to start here because I want us to see how the Lord is feeding Elijah. Yeah. The Lord is giving Elijah a drink. The Lord is already concerned about Elijah's sustenance and provision. He is the prophet of God called to stand in this hour against uh, Ahab and Jezebel. And the Lord is already looking after him. Amen. The Lord has been doing this. He's sending uh, food to him with ravens. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. They bring bread and meat yeah. for him. And he's giving them water from a brook. Yeah. And so I want us to see how the Lord had already been working in Elijah's life, providing for him, giving him what he needs yeah. so that he can do the word of God. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a good and so 
The Lord is concerned with our physical needs. We know that. And I think he's even more concerned with our spiritual needs. Amen. Yes. But, but we need both, right? Amen. We need both. We need to eat. And so, Elijah was already living a life dependent on the supernatural provision from the Lord, as we can see in chapter 17. Yeah. As, as we heard last week, we, Elijah goes on to walk in very miraculous things, right? He raises the widow's son from the dead. Yeah. He boldly confronted Ahab, knowing that he might be killed. He calls forth the entire nation of Israel for the great showdown. How long will you go on limping between two different opinions? Oh, if the yes. Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. He told the entire nation of Israel this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right? The, the narrative is, is familiar, and we can never hear enough of it. Amen. Because it's amazing. And so, Elijah goes on to set up an altar with 12 stones, because he's thinking of the sons of Jacob. He prays to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom he refers to in this situation as Israel. Yeah. Because he wants us to think of Israel. Amen. We need to think of the nation that God chose to recover the entire nation back to him. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. we need to know this. Elijah wants us to know this. The writer wants us to know this. And he says, let it be known this day, in his prayer, he says that you are God yeah. in Israel. Hallelujah. And that I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. We heard the, the, the confidence of Elijah. Yeah. That he knows who his God is. He knows that he is his servant. He knows who he is. And he knows that he's doing what God has told him to do. Amen. And then we arrived at 1 Kings 19. Where the story, the story began to shift a little bit. You'll remember that. But it seems like, okay, something is happening here. Where Elijah receives the death threat from Jezebel. And he runs for his life. And then he comes to Beersheba, and he's, he, left, he leaves his servant there, and he goes a day's journey into the wilderness and finds a broom tree where he lies on and he falls asleep. And he prays to the Lord, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And so, as we dove into that last week, we're going to dive a little bit deeper this week. Come on. Oh, amen. Um, and we're going to keep on reading through this chapter and see what the Lord has for us. Yeah. Amen. Um, but as I was, as I was continuing to reflect on this throughout the week, Elijah is at this point where he is maybe comparing himself in an unhealthy way against those who went before him. Yeah. That did great, amazing things. And maybe could be saying, I don't match up, right? We, we heard this last week. Yeah. I don't compare. I, I could never live up to their steps in this moment. But I, as I was thinking on it, um, Elijah is in this moment it's almost like he's reflecting right? this is a very reflective inward prayer like yeah. he's thinking of himself right? I am no better than my father's now I was, I was, I was sensing like there's some sort of guilt like he's feeling here like almost some sort of condemnation like, like what if Elijah in the flesh he, he, he runs, runs away from Jezebel and then he gets to this point and now he's kind of like Ah, oh, I shouldn't have run away from Jezebel. I should have stood my ground. I, why did I do that? You ever felt that way where you did something, I said something, why did I say that? Yeah. Uh, and, and now it seems like it's inward. It, you know that the attack on Elijah right now doesn't seem like it's actually coming from Jezebel anymore, although there is an outward circumstance. At this point, it seems like it's coming from inside, from himself. Yeah. I am no better than my father. Right. How could I fail? Why did I not stood up to her? I should have stood my ground. I, I did this to the prophets. Why did I run in fear? Right. And it seems like it's a reflective sort of prayer and thinking that's happening in Elijah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. And so, so as we keep that in mind, we're going to move on yeah. through, through the narrative and through what the Lord has for us, right? Last week, we received the call to put to death our flesh yeah. that could lead us to look at our fathers and think, I could never do what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, we are being called to look at those who have gone before us and be strengthened by their testimonies. Yeah. Right? We, we jumped in, we looked in a little bit into what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob represent. Yeah. Right? There's many things these men did. But Abraham was a man that was willing to go. And then Isaac was a man that was willing to lay down on the altar and die. And Jacob was a man that was willing to fight and be tenacious and take hold of what's heavenly. And so instead of being um, down on us by that, I could never live up to that. We're called to be strengthened by that. Amen. They did it, and the same God that was feeding Abraham is feeding Elijah. Yeah. And the same God that's feeding Isaac is feeding Elijah. And the same God that is feeding Jacob is feeding us today. Amen. And so this is the, the call to rise. Amen. The God has not changed, and he's yeah. still working through imperfect people today. Amen. 
Come on, if God hasn't changed, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if God hasn't changed, then that means the very words that Oscar's recapping with us, that Elijah wrestled with and went through, you could possibly be wrestling with those same things and be serving the same exact God. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So do you believe that in your wrestling that the Lord is going to teach you and train you? Sure, yeah. Obviously, we're continuing a bit of recap because I couldn't couldn't move forward or, or I couldn't allow Oscar to go forward into the body of this message without revisiting a little bit about wrestling, okay? A little bit about wrestling. Now, if you go to, you don't have to go there, actually. I'll tell you where it's at. The book of Hosea 12. The book of Hosea 12, it says this in verse 3. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. Who's it talking about? Jacob. Jacob. He was trying to land a good old-fashioned heel hook in the womb on his brother. He was a wrestler from the beginning. Now, his wrestling that he's doing here, we could say, uh, is done in, in, a, in a negative light, right? Like, he's just a fighter by nature. He's aggressive by nature. It's St. Patty's Day, so Irish people are aggressive by nature, right? After a few beers. After a few of those good beers. This man was aggressive. It was in his nature. What's in your nature, church? What's in your nature? In your very nature is the fact that you want to rule over yourself. Did you know that? And you have thoughts about yourself. And when you have seeming failures, like Brother Oscar's talking about with Elijah, like, why did I do this? I should have just faced this. I should have done this. Your ruling nature says, I've messed it up and I've ruined it. And now all is lost. we got to look at something real quick in Jacob's life. It says in his manhood, though, he strove with God. So Hosea 12, 3 tells us in the womb, he took his brother by the heel. But in his manhood... Everybody say manhood. manhood. As he's growing and he's, as he's maturing, his wrestling is also maturing and changing. You got young kids in the house. You know what it's like in your home at dinner night last night, right, Michael? It's chaos and there's wrestling, there's fighting, there's arguing, and they're immature in it. So it's just chaotic. We're not saying don't wrestle. We're saying learn how to wrestle properly with the things of God. And I, I just received that a bit from Brother Oscar last week when I referred back to Hosea. In his manhood, though, he strove with God, and he strove with the angel, and he prevailed. Yeah. Yeah. Elijah was struggling and prevailing under this tree. Brother Oscar's going to touch on some of that today. Yeah. But he realized what his wrestling was going to produce. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So when we think about Genesis 25, we think about the heel, we think about uh, this wrestling, we think of Jacob's name meaning supplanter or meaning replacement. There was... There's so much around this that we could, we, could, uh, we could deal with, but we won't. From Oscar's notes himself, he wrote, this paints a beautiful picture as we think of Jacob wrestling with this angel. Oscar wrote, wrestling means getting low to the ground, getting dusty, getting sweaty. It's an act of lowering oneself to fight and to contend. Yeah, man. How are we doing with that? Corey, have you had some fights in your life, physical and spiritual? Amen. Yes, I know about both of them in this room. I know about both those type of fights. Amen. And I know that Corey has matured in such a way. Just ask him about it. Ask his wife about it. Ask their family about how they are wrestling and contending now with new hope. Yeah. It's no longer does he go into a spiritual battle and he's totally defeated before he starts. Right. He goes into a spiritual battle now like, what do you got for me, Satan? What do, you, what do you got next? What could possibly be next? I've, I've conquered this. I've watched my wife conquer this. I've watched my children conquer this. I mean, I can literally go around the room with testimonies of what I've seen in your very life. And we're going to get to that a bit of how important that is for you to know about the wrestling of your brother Corey and your sister uh, Tessa. It's very important that you know it. And we're going to touch on that a bit here in just a moment as well. But I must say that Jacob struggled, struggled from his birth. He struggled from his birth until his death. More so than Abraham and more so than Isaac. This was just his lot. It was just his call in his life was to struggle. And he did it for you. Amen. He did it for me so that we could see these things. It tells us in this that yet he was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Did you know that? Amen. Do you remember that? Amen. The man that struggled, the man that was holding on to his brother's heel, the man that tricked his brother and received his birthright. This man that was wrestling becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. Do you just feel like all is lost for you? Or are we too darn proud to say, I need to lower myself. Amen. I need to humble myself. I'm wrong. I'm wrong and I need a paradigm shift in my life. This is, what, this is what Jacob did. 
He struggled, but he was the father of the 12 tribes. Jacob's struggles are your struggles. They're our struggles, church. And as followers of the way, as followers and, and men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit in this room, we, we don't always get the meaning of these struggles. But we must hold fast to the conviction that God is in control and that he uses our pain. This is hard to hear, okay? But he uses our pain to increase our faith. Isn't that crazy? The world would say, what are you doing? Curse God and die, like they told Job, right? But he says, if you endure this, your faith will be made stronger. Amen. And the last few things I'll note is Matthew eleven twelve. 12. This is what Jacob was. He was an aggressive and violent man. And we know that since John the Baptist until now, this is how the kingdom of God will advance. It will suffer this, but it will advance because men and women will choose to bear their cross through the chaos and they will follow the way. And what they'll have is this. It'll seem chaotic, but they'll know that it's necessary for refinement. It is absolutely necessary for your humbling that you wrestle, that you wrestle with these spiritual things, just as Elijah has done, just like we're going to see Elijah's doing. And what this leads is what we're going to see in the life of Elijah continuously is that it led him to greater levels of revelation and realization is what the Lord was actually doing. So do we want to wrestle? Yeah. Come on. We're, we're getting there. 30% of you want to wrestle. I'll just ask it again in case it was too fast a question and you can re-answer the same way. Do you want to wrestle? Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look a little bit into Elijah's journey so far. Yes. Um, again, I wish I could show you our map, but our screen is not working today. So, but we're gonna, but we're gonna begin seeing this in, in the spirit. All right, Mount, Mount Carmel is where he is where he confronts the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Mount Carmel is very northern Israel. From there, he ran 15 miles toward Jezreel, and he outran the he outran the chariots of Ahab. So 15 miles, full throttle. <laughs> okay, when was the last time you ran 15 miles at full speed? I've never done that. And outran some horses. Wow. Okay, so he so he he runs 15 miles. He gets to Jezreel, and that's when he receives the threat from um, Jezebel, and he flees roughly about 110 miles south towards Beersheba. Of a flea. Okay, so he's up here he's going south towards Beersheba there he leaves his servant and the scripture says in the first few verses of chapter 19 that he goes on a day's journey <laughs> yeah. however he could walk in a day yeah. and that's when he arrives to the broom tree and in this broom tree the Lord is meeting him yes, come on. and he lay down and he slept under a broom tree verse 5 and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Amen. Yeah. Say, Arise and eat. Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was out of his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. The church, there is a journey ahead that is too great for us. We can't do it. Alone. We yeah. can't do it without God's heavenly provision. Yeah. Yeah. We won't stand. We don't stand a chance. Yeah. Right. Now, you have to think at this point, Elijah has already been walking over a hundred miles. There's, there's, there's heat that he's walking through. As we'll see, there's, there's a des desert area that he's going to be walking towards. Yeah. He's exhausted. He's physically exhausted. I want us to see this. He's physically exhausted and he, all the shade he can find is under a tree. Likely. And he's physically exhausted. He's emotionally and spiritually under oppression by his own flesh, by the enemy. And so he finds a little bit of shade and he lays down to sleep. Yeah. Exhausted physically and spiritually. And the Lord, there, the Lord finds him there and he sends an angel to tell him, arise and eat. Amen. So good. And watch what verse 8 says. And he arose. Come on. And he ate and he drank. Get up. And went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, 
the mount of God. That food carried him 40 days and 40 nights. Now from that broom tree where he found himself at that point, all the way to the mount of God, which is Horeb, also known as Sinai. Okay, this is the same mount. It has two names. Some, some scholars would say there's two sides to it. One side is known as Horeb, another side is known as Sinai. Some scholars say there's two peaks to it. One is Horeb, one is Sinai. We're familiar with Sinai. I'm not as familiar with Horeb. This is the same mount where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Amen. So from the broom tree where he's found himself and he arises and he eats, he has to walk 249 miles, roughly, from where he is in Beersheba all the way down south to where Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb is. 249 miles with the food that the angel gave him. See, the journey ahead is too great for him. He can't do it without the Lord's provision. The journey ahead for us is too great for us. So if we don't arise and eat now, we won't make it through. We'll stay either under the shade and die, or we'll try to go without him and die in the desert. And so he's going towards Horeb. It's very interesting when you look into this, the word Horeb, or the meaning of Horeb, it means desert. That's really good. When you look into the meaning of Sinai, which is the same mount, it means thorny. So the Lord is leading Elijah to a thorny desert to meet with him. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Sounds like prosperity. Like, like the journey ahead is no easy. It's not an easy journey. It's that the gate is narrow that leads to life. Come on, yeah. yeah. The gate is wide that leads to death. Yeah. Ooh, but the, the path to life is narrow, it's thorny, yeah. it's desert, it's, there's heat. But God gives the provision to yeah. walk there. Yeah. And Elijah arises and he begins walking. Yeah. And that's all he knows what to do, but that's what God is calling him to do. Yeah. And we pick it up in verse 9. <clears throat> and there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind toward the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Yeah. But the Lord was not in the wind. Nope. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Wow. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood at the entrance oh, of the cave. Amen. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. That is, that's very interesting when we look at a map. Damascus is all the way up north again. He has to go back all the way where he came from. I want you to have that in your mind as you read this. The Lord tells him, go, return on your way to Damascus, to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu to be son, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of abel Mehola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just say this. I'm going to, I'm going to say the title. Because that's like what you just did. Even though we didn't decide on that title officially. Amen. The Lord if, we says. Change, if we change it later, we can still change it. The Lord says. But I feel like it's a good time. Because who wants to go back? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who wants to go back? If you've, if you've traveled 110 miles, right? That's what he traveled that first time. W walking. Say it again. To a horror? Yeah. Oh, it's about 350 at this point. Okay, so he's traveled this 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 way, this distance. He gets there, the Lord's speaking with him, what are you doing? He's going through this, he says, Go back. Does anyone want to do that? No. Does Elijah want to do that? No. But he knows that there is something very necessary about the pressing. That's gonna be our title. Yeah. The necessary pressing. Amen. The necessary Hallelujah. pressing yes. that will have a great produce. It'll have a produce in your life. And we're going to speak about it here a little more in just a moment. 
that this necessary pressing is going to produce a precious oil even. It's going to produce things in your life that are very much needed and they're very much uh, here for us to receive and to grow from. A necessary pressing is needed in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's speak up in the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Good word, man. Very good word. Amen. Exodus 3. We read this last week. I want to re re revisit it because it's important to have some of these things in mind as we continue looking at Elijah. So Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Okay, Moses is coming up this mountain. He's, he's keeping the flock of his father-in-law. And he comes up to Horeb, the mountain of God. Wow. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. This is the same mountain that Elijah finds himself going towards. The Lord calls Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. We read verses 14 and 15 and 16 last week. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Yeah. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Yeah. So it's important that we, that we go back to that because Moses finds himself hearing from God in the mount, the mountain of God, which is horror, which is Sinai. And we know that the Lord continues to lead Moses up the mountain, even to the top of the mountain, it says later in, in, in chapter 19 of Exodus. Uh, and there was a great fire. It was a, it was a terrible sight. It was a, a fearful sight because fire had come from heaven when God caused Moses to go up the mountain. And so I want us to begin to connect this idea of Moses is being called up a mountain, the same mountain. Yeah. And the Lord had brought fire from heaven. You can read this in Exodus 19. And, and the Lord calls Moses to go into the mountain that's burning with fire from heaven. Yeah. Like, would you dare to go there? <laughs> right. Amen. You might die alive. Right? He's afraid. When it, we just read Moses his, hit his face because he's afraid to look at God. Yeah. Yeah. There's a fear of God that should move us. Yeah. Yeah. A rightful fear of that's God. Good. Because he... He is, he is God Almighty. Good. Come on. And so, the Lord is leading Elijah up, the mount, up, up to Mount Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights. Yep. Moses went to Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights, and he received the law, yeah. the word of God, the living bread. Amen. Amen. The journey is great ahead, is very great Amen. ahead of him, of Elijah and Moses. A thorny desert separates both of these men from reaching their destiny by God's holy abode. So God calls Moses up into a furnace of fire. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine stepping there? Elijah has been called up to a mountain and it's going to take him 250 miles to the heat and up a mountain to get there. And so... There's something special about this man, right? Yeah. Moses and Elijah. We could say that. Yeah. Lack, words lack to say that. Yeah. There's, there's something that God saw in this man. So I can work with them if you just trust me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what we begin to think of us. I can work with you if you just trust me. More, yeah. You don't have the strength, but I'm going to give you the strength, Moses. We know Moses said, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow yeah. of speech. Yeah. I can't do it. I'm going to give you the strength, Moses. I'm going to give you what you need. Yeah. There was another man who fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. We read this in Matthew 4. Amen. This man, Jesus. Come on. You ever heard that name before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeshua. Amen. He also went up a mountain, as we know in Matthew 17. This mountain we know as the Mount of Transfiguration. Yep. Come on. 
In this case, Jesus, when he's going up to Mount of Transfiguration, he brings with him Peter, James, and John. And so we can pick up now in Matthew 17. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Stay there when you're there. Hallelujah. Matthew 17, verse 1 says, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So he says, he led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses and Elijah appear to Jesus and begin talking with him. Amen. Moses, the, fir the, the first man that we hear in scripture that fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and went up the mountain. Right. Elijah, the other man that we hear that goes up a mountain and God's leading up a mountain and 40 days, 40 nights and the provision of bread and water that God gave him. And they're meeting now Jesus. Amen. The third man that is written in scripture that has gone to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where he was tempted by the devil. Yeah. And he stood firm and he stood his ground, yeah. filled the full of the Holy Spirit. Now these three men are having a conversation. Amen. Isn't that amazing? That's yeah. awesome. Fantastic. And, and what, what even amazes me even more is that Jesus brought with him Peter, James, and John. Amen. And they get to see this. They get to see Jesus being transfigured and show a more intimate part of who he is. Yeah. That there's another nature that Jesus possesses that he's letting them see his disciples this yeah. and he's letting them into the conversation that he's having with Moses and Elijah and as I was pondering through through Elijah's journey up the mountain and hearing from God there's there's a lot that's happening right the, the fire the earthquake the wind and God is in the slow gentle whisper and his word is go return and anoint Hasael, and anoint Jehu, and anoint Elisha. Notice, they're, God calls him to anoint three men. The call for Elijah after this whole journey is to go and anoint three other men. The Lord also gives him insight about what, he, about what he's going to do in Israel. Mm -hmm. Only leaving 7,000 remaining. And there's, there's heavenly insight that is given to Elijah. But what really struck me is, now God is using Elijah to go anoint three other men. Amen. Jesus is at the Mount of Transfiguration and he's been walking with disciples and he brings them up with him. This is, good. Yeah. is this just part of his discipleship training? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it helps, but it seems to me like there's something more. Yeah. Yeah. Like God is, or Jesus is producing or allowing them to be so close to him that they're going to be smeared with something. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Wow. And so God calls Elijah to go and anoint three men. Yeah. There is a physical element that was used for anointing, as we see in Torah. Yeah. Yeah. And that element is oil. Yeah. Oil is used for anointing. Yeah. And so, when we're thinking of Elijah, he's being pressed to the core, shaken to the core, but has arisen and has eaten. And now he's meeting with God. And God tells him, go and anoint somebody else. There's this pressing that has happened in Elijah's life. That's good. There's this fruit that Elijah... Is bearing, but now is being pressed, and the very fruit that God is pressing through Elijah, He's going to use to anoint other men. Amen. Are you all catching that? Yeah. yeah. Somebody say Amen. That's so good. Amen. Okay. Elijah is being pressed. Think of an olive; it's got to be pressed to produce oil, and this is what God has done so that Elijah is able to go and anoint three others. Come on. Yeah. Um, get out of here real quick. Have you ever been sitting around the fire? Someone's testifying of something that's been pressing them. It's just use it, Brother Adrian. Brother Adrian's pressing. He's he's testifying of a pressing in his life. Did you ever heard that? Yeah. Out of your brother Adrian? Yeah. Was anybody affected directly by his pressing? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Were you? Yeah. yeah. That's what we're talking about here. Amen. This oil that's being brought forth out of Elijah, the Lord's saying, This is good and this is precious. I want you now to physically take the oil and go anoint them. Amen. But it was so much more than that. It was so much more than just that physical oil. It was the oil. You could use Brother Oscar for this too. It's the oil that's being pressed out of him. Okay, it's, it's spiritual, right? His life is producing something. Yeah. We're calling that oil to give you an imagery. 
but what's being produced out of him, what's being pressed and produced out of Adrian, it should directly affect your brothers. Yeah. That's why the pressing is necessary. And that's why we wanted to add a little olive picture on there too. We'll try to work on that, Zeke. But that, that's what we're talking about. An olive is pressed. Oil comes out. And that oil is used for things. It's used in the temple. The precious oil that's pressed the most pure is used for anointing. We know it's used for burning. We know it's used for food. We know it's, it's used medicinally. In, in Bible times, this oil had many purposes. But this pressing produced such a sweet oil. And I love when Oscar last night, we were together for a little bit, when he used that word smearing. I loved it. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Because if you're covered in oil and you walk by your brother, it should smear some oil on him. Yeah. It should leave a mark on his yeah. life. This, yeah. Yeah. this yeah. oil is dripping off of you men. Yeah. It's dripping off of you women. If you've been baptized in this fiery furnace that he went up into, there's, there's so much that comes from the pressing. Allow the pressing to happen. It's necessary. Amen. And then let your brothers be and your sisters be directly affected by your pressing. This is something very beautiful that's being shown to our church body. And we're only going to gain more revelation on it as Brother Oscar keeps walking us through it. Amen. Amen. We can pick up in Leviticus chapter 8. We're reading verses 10 to 13. Yep. Say pressing when you're there. Pressing. 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 Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. You see, this is one man pouring oil over another man. Yeah. Moses pour, pouring oil over Aaron. Aaron had beaten the provision for Moses earlier on. Right, when Moses said, I can't speak, I'm slow of speech, God gave him Aaron. Amen. Moses is anointing him. Now he's anointing him. There's, there's this call towards God pressing a man and using that oil to anoint another man. Yeah. Yeah. So he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed, anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tight sashes around their waist and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, so we see this, the element of oil here. We see that there is a, a, a consecration that yeah, happens yeah. Uh, in, in the case of anointing another man. There's a separation that's occurring. There's, there's a precious thing. Let's go to James chapter 5. As I was interacting with Brother Clayton last week, he brought up this verse and it became very instrumental as to what the Lord Amen. was uh, showing us for this week. In James chapter 5, we're going to read in verse 13. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Are you all familiar with this verse? Yeah. yeah. Anyone sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Amen. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Yeah. All right, so we see the anointing oil. We see the, the call for an elder to, in this case, to anoint somebody in the church who needs healing. Yeah. Right? We see the call for praying for each other. We see the call to confess sin to one another. We confess to God. Amen. Yes, he is a great high priest, Jesus Christ. And we confess to one another for freedom and deliverance. There's a healing that happens when we confess to one another. Amen. So this is already amazing in and of itself if we stop there. But if you read verse 17, it becomes even more beautiful. Because James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's good. Elijah. He's just talking about anointing. He's just talking about coming to the elders for anointing and pouring oil for healing and then he goes on to talk about Elijah yeah. mm -hmm. 
Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and, and the earth bore its fruit. Amen. Wow. The earth bore its fruit. Notice wow. when Elijah prayed, the, the fruit started coming yeah. back up from the earth. Uh -huh. yes. There's a fruit that's Lord that the Lord is has produced in the life of Elijah. There's a fruit that God has been producing through his life, but now he's pressing and it's becoming a beautiful yeah. produce yeah. for yeah. others. Yeah. It's becoming food for others around him to eat. It's becoming oil for the anointed and consecration of other men that are going to play a great part in God's eternal plan. Amen. See, God is setting up this man in power. Uh, even even Jehu, uh, Jehu and Hazael, kings, and Elisha, the prophet that's going to uh, come after him. Yeah. Amen. Come on, you know that's because the Lord desires for you to eat and drink. Amen. And he desires for you to eat and drink, but he desires for you to do that in order that you might be satisfied. Did you know that? Like he actually cares about your satisfaction, but it's when you're properly eating or you're properly drinking that which he has told you. Remember, we're looking for spiritual eyes here to enlighten us in what that means. That's what we're after this morning. So real quick, I'm going to be fast because Oscar's got to dive back into uh, some living things, some living things. But I could not help be stirred by this verse. And so I'm going to read you a portion of it, and then I'm going to give you the reference. The portion that I'm going to read you says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them... Oh, I messed up. I'm so sorry. I'm going to read this grouping of scripture to you first. So... Red flashing thing. You're all, you don't remember. It says this. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers. A promise was made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He says to give you great and splendid cities. Guess what? You didn't build them. Houses full of good things. Guess what? You did not fill them. Hewn cisterns or dug out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees. Guess what? You didn't plant them. And he says this. All of that which you did not do and you necessarily did not deserve. He says you shall eat and you shall be satisfied. Then watch yourself. At least you forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt. The house of slavery. That's Deuteronomy 6, 10. Yeah. What I wasn't supposed to tell you was it comes right after Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Which... And scripture comes right after Deuteronomy chapter 5. Yes, you got it. Bible scholars. Deuteronomy 5 comes before 6. And in Deuteronomy 5, we have a very reminder of the bread of life that was given to Moses. It's a reminder. In chapter 5, he's telling them the Ten Commandments again. He's repeating yeah. how important this Amen. is for you. And then, that's why I read 10 through 13 first, those are the promises which you do not deserve. Yeah. That's the, I will say, that's the nutrients. That's the life-giving bread. Amen. That's the life-giving water that yeah. you don't deserve. Amen. The olives, the, the oil, the food, the housing, the sustenance yeah. that you yeah. don't deserve. You know that's how you good. get it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Amen. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul. These words, otherwise, this bread that I am commanding you to eat today, eat it with all of your heart and soul. Yeah. Consume it. And don't stop there. As you have consumed it, let it be pressing you so that you will teach it to your children, so you'll sit in the house, so that this oil, this, this living word is producing and pressing an oil out of me that goes into the next generation. And then when we lie down, when we rise up, we're binding them with signs on our hands and the frontals of our foreheads, Amen. writing them on our doorposts. Right after that is when 10 through 13 takes place. Yeah. Then I'm going to give you all this stuff you did not deserve. And you know why? What we're reading in Elijah, the very things we're reading in these words and what Brother Oscar is about to take us into with these nutrients, eat and consume this Amen. and let it just pour out of your life. You don't have to say anything. Yeah. It should be pouring out of you. Yeah. We all want to talk. We all want to say something. We all got the, the right word at the right time. And perhaps you do. Yeah. That's a good thing if you do. Amen. But be pressed. Yeah. Be low. And if the Lord uses you, praise God. If Amen. he doesn't, praise God. Yeah. You're still producing oil yeah. for the Amen. King of Kings and yeah. the Lord of Lords. Good.
Amen. So there's a reason we're calling this nutrients. Yes. Okay, for Elijah, this was bread and water. We're going to get to the nutrients part in a second, but we're going to talk about the living water. Yep. But Elijah is, has at this point, we've read the story, has received living water. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We talked a little bit about it last week, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. John 7, 38 says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, He's crying out, saying, there's a desperation here. There's a, there's a, there's a call out for those who are thirsty to come. Yeah. If anyone is thirsty, he says, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Yeah. Amen. But this is spoke of the Holy Spirit, yeah. whom those who believed in him were to receive. Come on. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Yeah. 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 Notice Jesus is quoting something from Scripture. He says, as the Scriptures have said, from His innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Yep. And there's no direct quotation there. We, yeah, yeah. we could be necessarily unsure where that comes from in the Scripture. There's several thoughts on that. There's many parts in the Older Testament that we could see that. Okay, We're going to land in Proverbs 4.23. He could be quoting this. He could not. But for Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Yeah, come on. Amen. From the heart flow springs of life. Yeah. Yeah. You see, Elijah has received a holy, heavenly, living water. And now from his heart, there's living water flowing towards other men. Amen. Exodus 17.1 then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Okay, in Exodus 17, the people of God have been brought out of Egypt. Right, he's been leading them by the wilderness so that they don't fight. We heard this, this, these messages a few weeks ago. God is a good shepherd. He knows how to lead. He knows what they're ready for and what they're not ready for. He leads them by the wilderness so that they don't have to fight, but they have to experience hunger and thirst. Amen. So Exodus 17, verse 3, it says, The people thirst there for water, and they grumbled against Moses. Why now have you brought us out from Egypt? You killed us and our children, to kill us, sorry, to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Mm -hmm. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. Yeah. The people of Israel are on Horeb. They're in a desert. Elijah is being led up to the Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, as we have already heard. They're thirsty. There's no water to drink there. Think of Elijah. There's no water. Unless God gives him to him, he's dead. Yeah. Yeah. The people here are complaining. They're grumbling. And God tells Moses, go to Mount Horeb, and there you shall strike the rock. Yeah. And water will come out of it that the people may drink. Yeah. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel. Yeah. And because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Wow. Come on. See, from Mount Horeb, God brings water from a rock. Yeah. Yeah. On Mount Horeb, God gives Moses the law. Yeah. Written by his finger, it says. The finger of God wrote in the stones. He gives them the bread. The water and the bread. The living water. We won't get to the bread too soon. We're talking about the water. Living water comes from the rock at Horeb. Yeah. Think of Elijah. He's, he's received this living water. First, first Corinthians 10, 4 says, They all drank, talking about the Israelites, they all drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Paul in Corinthians is talking about the nation of Israel. They were grumbling, they were, but, they, but God was giving them water. And he says that rock was Christ. The rock was Christ. He is the living water. 
that we ought to receive and drink yeah. so that we can walk the way that is ahead of us. Amen. The journey is too great. We need this heavenly water. We need to drink from the rock of Christ. Amen. As mentioned already, he also on Sinai or Horeb, he gives the law. His word, the bread. Amen. To the other man who fasted 40 days and 40 nights, Moses. To that man, he's also giving bread and water, just like Elijah. Yeah. Hallelujah. John 6.33 says, The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus is the rock. He is the spiritual rock. He's also the bread of life Amen. who comes down from heaven. He himself said it in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Amen. In John 6, 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Amen. And, the, and the bread that I will give for this life, for the life of the world, is my flesh. Yeah. It's flesh. Hebrews 4, 12 tells us that the word of God is alive and active. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 1 John 1, 1 refers to Jesus as the word of life. Amen. First Peter 1, 23, I'm just throwing this at you. You're just yeah. receiving from heaven right now. You'll write it later. Yeah. First Peter 1, 23 says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, right, right. through the living and enduring word yeah. of God. Amen. This is our life. Amen. Life is in the word of God. Life is in the heaven, the bread that came from heaven. Amen. Amen. And so these are the nutrients, the water and the bread. Yeah. 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 This is what's to feed us. This is what's to give us life, to raise us up from the dead. We were all dead at one point in our trespasses. Yeah. Yeah. And he brought us to life. And he gave us, he quickened us with his spirit. And he gave us food that we could stand and, and, and walk forward. Amen. Yeah. And so Elijah finds himself exhausted from the journey. right? The heat, the guilt for running away, the sense of failure. The loneliness, spiritually and physically exhausted. He finds shade under a broom tree and asks God to take his life and falls asleep. But God sends him heavenly provision yeah. or heavenly nutrition, yep. bread and water. And then will give him the strength that he needs to keep walking, to keep going, to keep fighting under the scorching heat and to go even farther than Elijah ever thought he could go. Amen. Yeah. See, from that point of the broom tree, he walks double the distance to Horeb than he had walked before, running away from Jezebel. And he goes up to the mountain of God, the holy hill, where God abides. Elijah does not quite know what is ahead of him yet, at that point where he was the broom tree. But like Abraham, he has to trust him and go. And like Isaac, he has to be willing to die to himself, not to, leave, not to stay there and die. To die to his own fear, his own doubt, his own thoughts of himself. He has to put that to death and rise up. And he has to live to God and what God wants to do through his life. And like Jacob, he has to keep fighting. He has to keep contending. He has to keep taking a hold of what's heavenly. And so at that point, Elijah had a decision to make. Either he remained under the deceiving shadow of the broom tree, sleeping and slowly dying, or he rises up and eats and continue his journey. Amen. 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 Our Father, God, is a good husband, right? Amen. You learned that on Thursday? You learned that on Thursday, right? The, the husbandry, right? That, the, the, that he was taking and caring for the garden, caring for the plants, caring for these very trees that were going to be producing a fruit, right? Yeah. We're looking at Elijah right now. And I just pray you give us like 15, 20 minutes to finish, okay? Can we do that? Amen. Because this is very important right now that you hear this. This is everything for us. Amen. Elijah has to make a decision, okay? Remain under the deceiving shadow of this tree, sleeping and slowly dying. That He's being pressed. He's got to make a decision. He's either going to rise up and eat the nutrients and the bread of life and the water that is of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to do that to continue his journey, right? Yeah. So he's being pressed. He's dying. He has to make a decision. He has to choose this day whom he's going to serve, what he's going to do. He must rise up and eat. 
And now as we're moving forward, we're talking about him rising up and eating is going to have a produce. Amen. This necessary Amen. pressing is going to have a produce. Yeah. And you know who knows that more than anyone else right now? Who knows that? Satan? Yeah, I'll take that one too. God and Satan. <laughs> the enemy, light and darkness know that the decision that's about to be made. Now, I'm not talking about Elijah. I'm talking about you now. Yeah. The decision that you're about to make and choosing this day whom you're going to serve. You're going to serve your flesh? Are you going to stay under that tree? Are you going to die? Or are you going to rise up this morning? Yeah. Right? Men and women, are we going to rise up this Lord, morning amen. and eat and have a produce in our amen. life? Yep. we got to keep in mind as we move forward that our Father is that good husband. Amen. He's that good manager or watcher of our well-being, of this vineyard, if you will. He does not desire to cut you down. He doesn't desire that. If you're dead and dying and you're still attached to the tree, we're going to talk about it. He desires to give you life and to Amen. give you a chance. Yeah. And as a pastor, Jake uh, quoted this scripture years ago to someone we were working with, and I've never forgotten it. And it's Luke 13. And it's the parable. It's the parable of a fig tree. Very short. We're talking three or four scriptures long, but powerful. Powerful because it's the very words of God. Yeah. Yeah. There's a call to repentance in chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus gives them a little bit of a, of a little bit of insight on that, telling them, you must repent or you will perish. Yeah. And then he goes on to give them a little bit of hope. And before Oscar continues, I want you to have a little hope. You're yeah. being pressed. Yes, you are. Yes, we are. We have a choice to make. Rise up. We're being told to eat. If we choose to do that and eat, Fruit will come yes. from your life. Amen. It's Hallelujah. Not, it's not our words. It's the very words of yes. life. He tells them this parable. He says, a certain man, we could say God, a certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and it didn't find any. Talking to us. Not talking about a fig tree. Now we're talking about your life. Amen. He's looking at your life. He's a good God who's looking at the lives of the people. If there's no fruit on it, he perhaps could say, behold, I've been looking at this tree for three stinking years. Three years I've looked at this tree and no fruits on it. He says, cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? Is that, is that, is that your life right now? Is it not producing fruit? And the Lord's saying, I should cut this down. Help us. But he answered and said to him, hey, let it alone, sir. There was a, I don't know, we could debate who, who's who here. God's saying cut it down. There's a Holy Spirit. Amen. There's this debate. I think of Jesus on the cross saying, hey, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. I always think of the wrestling match that Jesus, fully man and fully God, had with fully God as the Holy Spirit. It's a lot going on there. We don't have to get too deep into it, but some point, somebody tells this owner, hey, let me try this. Let it alone for this year too. Give me one more year with it. I'm going to dig around it. I'm going to put some dung around it or some fertilizer around it. I'm going to put some nutrients around it. I'm going to I'm gonna try something here. Is this your life? Is the Lord pleading for your life right now? Might be the only chance you get in this room right now. Or the Lord saying, God, I'm going to cut that tree down because I'm sick of it taking space of another man that should be standing in that ground growing who wants to grow. And the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 not yet, God, not yet. Let's dig it up a little bit and stir it up and change some things and see what we get. Amen. And he said, if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. And if I'm not mistaken, that's it. That's all we get of that parable. <laughs> and then we just have to use the rest of the word, which we're going to, and which we, we see in Matthew 10. We see what happens when something doesn't produce fruit over time. Yeah. It eventually is cut off yeah. and cast into the fire. This parable must stir us to this beautiful idea of fruitfulness. Yeah. Fruitfulness. In this case, a certain man, God had a vineyard. He's watching over it. But mercifully, the vine dresser is allowed to work. Yeah. Think of the Holy Spirit. What is he doing in your life right now? Amen. I almost just want to beg with you. Yeah. What is he whispering in your ear right now? That small, still voice saying, go back. <laughs> go back. 
I have something for you. I have something for your family. I got 7,000 people who haven't bowed a knee to Baal, but I need you to go back. I need you to hear from me and go back. So good. Come on. Uselessness invites disaster. If you're useless, you're inviting disaster into your life. If something's only taking, it cannot survive. Do you hear that? If something's only taking, yeah. those dead branches that we're going to speak about, right. if they're only taking, they can't live. They have to produce something. Amen. God does give second chances to us, though, and that is beautiful and not to be taken lightly in this yeah. room. If you're hearing me and you know that you have denied, you've denied the nutrients, you've denied the digging up, you've denied any of it in your life, know that this is a second chance. But also we have to remember that there is a final chance chance there is a final chance where you have and then god cast you out forever we're going to move forward amen john 15 verse 1 i am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that he may bear more fruit think of elijah He's bearing more fruit than he's ever had before. And it comes with pruning. Yeah. It comes with pressing. Amen. Yeah. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Where is the fruit produced? Well, the fruit is produced from the roots of the earth, right? The earth is giving it nutrients. The fruit is produced in the vine, but where is the fruit manifested or bore? It's in the branches. He is the vine, we are the branches. He is producing the fruit. We're not called to produce the fruit. We can't produce the fruit ourselves. We're called to abide. Yeah. We're called to eat and drink. We're called to take on the nutrients yeah. Yeah. and to bear the fruit like branches. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The fruit is born in us. Yeah. We carry the fruit that he is producing. Right. And what is the fruit for? What does one do with a nice, uh, rich mango? <laughs> You're going to eat it. Fruit is for eating. And so the fruit that God is producing in your lives on, amen. It's good. is to be eaten by others amen. around you. Yeah. Amen. It's incredible. Amen. See, it's like the oil. Ephesians 5, 28 talks about Jesus nourishing his own body. Amen. He cherishes it. He nourishes it. The fruit that is being produced through his body, the church, which is us. Right? He is divine. We are connected with him. We are the branches. That fruit that is being produced is for his own, the nourishment of his own body Amen. first. Yeah. Yep. That means the fruit that's being produced in Adrian is for Clayton to Amen. eat from. Amen. Come on. And the oil that is being produced from Clayton is for Corey to be smeared with. Yeah. Amen. Come on. You see, we could go on around the room yeah. doing this that's because good. we're rubbing with each other as Pastor Sack was showing yeah. us earlier. But there's a fruit that God wills to produce through us, through his branches, that benefits and benefits and nourishes his own body. Amen. Right, Ephesians 4 talks about the body building itself up in love. Yeah. Yeah. When every part is working properly, yeah. every part of the body, every fruit is producing, every branch is producing fruit, then the body can eat from the fruit that is being produced in each other. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is this is the call forward to us. If we have if we are arising and we're eating, then the Lord is going to produce his fruit through us. Amen. That those around us can begin eating of that fruit. And that I can begin, begin eating of the fruit of those who are around me. Can anyone say here that you've eaten of the fruit of your brothers and sisters? Yes. Yes. Right? There's fruit being produced in this body that has absolutely changed my life. Yeah. I can attest and testify to that. I was not this, like this fig tree three and a half years ago. Yeah. I was a man that was fruitless and dying. Yeah. And I can stand here three years later and say, 
Lord, thank you that there was a, a man to intercede. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and an actual man and woman here in this body. That I could receive and eat from this fruit and actually receive it under that tree over there on that field. Which is actually painting an amazing picture because the man who trusts in the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of water. You see this analogy here. He's the vine, we are the branches. There's a tree and we are eating from that fruit. So the body is primarily to be eating from the fruit being produced in the body. Right? Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, Amen. it says uh, Colossians 3.16. Admonish each other with psalms and hymns and songs and spiritual songs. and See, we are to be doing this for each other. Amen. Maybe there's a, there's a prophetic word that Brother Chris Paul has that we all need to hear. What if Brother Chris decides to be distracted? I'm, I'm just using you, brother, for an example. But he's not. He's here. He's eating. He's arising. I know, of a, I know of a man that's eating... In this body, uh, Pop, Mr. Vermillion. I got the yeah. chance to eat with him yeah. uh, lunch some weeks ago, and he told me he started in Genesis, yeah. and he's Amen. really, really far along the way. He's Amen. been eating. Amen. And there's fruit that's been produced. Yeah. And so there's a fruit that God wills to produce to Brother Chris Paul that is yeah. for this body to eat, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. He's eating from what God is doing here. Amen. And so in a tree, there's... Living branches, as we heard in John 15, and there's also dead branches. Yep. How is it possible that the same tree can have dead branches and living branches? So it seems very simple. I feel like I've seen this, but it, it was profound to me. Yeah. Um, and I went out the back of my house, mm -hmm. our house in our, in our backyard, and I just went on looking for some branches. And I found a tree. And I tried to snap a, a branch, and it didn't break. It was really flexible. It kind of bent. And I was holding it still on one arm. So I just had a, one hand to do it. And I actually had to, like, like try to fight really hard to rip it off. And I pulled it off, and I looked inside of it, and it was green. And it was very, looked like there was moisture in there. Yeah. And then on the same tree, I looked around, and I saw a branch that looked like, and this one's probably dead. And I grabbed it, and it snapped right away. On the same tree. Yeah, yeah. There were branches that were alive that I, I had to fight really hard with my own hand to try to break it off and I had to twist it and it was green inside. And the other branch, I snapped it right off. Yep. And even some dust, kind of like sawdust, came out of it like boom, it's yeah. dead. Just dead. It was still connected to the tree, but dead. It's good. And so, same about the same about of course, my mind begins to run. Okay, so how is this possible? Let me, let me go. Google this. <laughs> Alright? And so, so I'm gonna share some, some things I found on Google with you regarding branches and trees. Thank you, Google. All right? It says almost always tree branches die due to natural causes that occur in the inner canopies or in the shade. And Mallory, if I'm wrong about this, you'll have to tell me later. Okay? Because you are the expert here. Alright, so most it says most branches die due to natural cause. A natural cause that a branch is in the inner canopy of a tree. This means that the branch is not receiving sun. But it's, it's kind of tucked in under the shadow of the same tree. That's good. It says due to that, they're not getting any sun. The tree begins to send nutrients to the branches that are that are in the sun. And require the nutrients. And, and taking away nutrients from the branch that is comfortably in the shade. That's good. Right? The branches that are being hit by the sun require more, so the tree is giving them more. The branches that are tucked away in the, in the shadow don't require as much, so eventually the tree will stop feeding it. I am the vine, you are the branches. Says Jesus. That's clear. That is very clear. In some cases, there's disease. A pest can invade a tree and feed on its vascular tissue. This can block water movement in the tree and cause it to not receive the nutrients. Vascular diseases are primarily fungi that block the flow of water and nutrients in the tree, yeah. causing entire branches to die back. So there's a natural cause, just tucked away, hiding under the shadow, and there's an external cause, a disease. Fungi that blocks the movement of water into the branch. We can begin to think of sin. We can begin to think of distractions of life. We can begin to think of 
whatever is causing us to not receive the nutrients from God. Yeah. The, the, the water of the Spirit, the bread of life. And, and if you heard last week, all I need to do is just read the word more. You have to hear it again in the Spirit because that's not it. It's not just about going and reading 10 chapters today. And I, no, there's... Yeah. It's, we have to hear this in the spirit. Oh, yeah. yes, okay, there's a lot more to eat. Yep. If you can read the chapters today, please do so. And be filled by it. Amen. And do it in the word of the spirit. But my warning is, don't just hear this and think, I just got to read the word more. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we have to read the word more. But there's more that needs to be eaten here. Yeah. There's a fruit that God is producing that needs to be eaten here. There's a, the water from the spiritual rock that he wants to give you. Yeah. Then you'll be able to eat more. But you don't have to concern yourself about... I just got to read more, read more, read more. And then you'll find yourself failing, failing. Ah, that's not it. Okay? He'll get you there, but you got to trust that he's going to feed you what he knows that you need. Amen. You have to remain connected. Dead branches are not helpful to the tree. They might prevent it from healing properly. At the same time, they allow pests and diseases to invade the tree. See, when a, when a branch is dead, the bark of the tree begins to kind of open up. We can think of this as our skin. If we're hurt, an open wound, an open wound paves the way for an external pathogen or something to come through in our own body. That's exactly what happens when a tree bark is exposed. Yeah. And so a dead branch needs to be cut off because eventually it, yeah. it could actually damage the tree. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We're thinking of John 15. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's a time frame for this. There's, there's a point where the branch needs to be cut off, which is what Jesus is telling us. Yeah. So eliminating dead branches gives the tree a new chance to rejuvenate itself. It directs the nutrients to healthy branches and makes it less vulnerable to disease. Yeah. Okay? However, if a branch is still connected to the tree, the plant, or the vine, the, the roots, might still try to use resources to revive that branch. Yeah. Okay, I want you to hear that again. Yeah. Like if you feel like, like this is maybe a little bit heavy, okay? Let it be heavy. Amen. But be encouraged by this. If you are connected to the tree and there's things that must come to life in you, the vine is trying its hardest. It's urging you to take from the nutrients. Yeah. It says the tree, as long as the branch is still connected, it might still be trying to give it resources. Yeah. Yeah. And give it and give it and give it. Yeah. Until there's a point where like, okay, you won't take it, so I have to cut you. Yeah. yeah. But if you take it, if you're connected, if you're if you're abiding, and if you're if there's something that's blocking you, well, maybe today is the day to get rid of that. Yeah. Yeah. If there's something that uh, is just causing a spirit of slumber, I'm just tucked away in the comfort of the shade. I can't go out in the heat. I'm afraid. There's fear. There's doubt. Well, today is the day to get rid yeah. of that, yeah. so that you may receive what God is really urging you to receive from Him. Come on, yeah, that's good. Now, Proverbs 11:30. It's a beautiful verse. Proverbs 11.30. Yeah, yeah. You can go there. When you get there, you can say tree of life. Tree of life. Tree of life. Tree of life. Amen. So Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he who is wise wins souls. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. You all remember what the tree of life was at the very beginning? In the garden? Yeah. And, and, and the Lord had given them access to the tree of life. Yeah. There was one tree he didn't give them access. It was yeah. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. But they had access to the tree of life. Yeah. After sin had entered, both men and women... In, in Genesis 3, 28, I believe, there's, this, there's now this urgency to, they must be removed from the garden yeah. unless they eat from yeah. the tree of life and live forever. Yeah. Because now sin has entered and there's separation. There's no life anymore. There's death has entered yeah. into man and woman. And so he has to send them out of the garden and then he sets cherubim to protect the way, to guard the way to the tree of life. Yeah. See, this way now to the tree of life can't just be accessed by men. Yeah. God has to provide the way. Yeah. He has to provide the way. From the very beginning, there's this sense of we have to go back to what God had given us that we neglected. Yeah. And we've all done this at some point in our lives. 
And we are coming back to him. And we are running back to him. Yeah. There is a way back to the tree of life. Yeah. Good. We've been reading in John 15. And you cannot read John 15 if we haven't read John 14. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way Amen. and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Who is the way to the tree of life? Yeah. It's Jesus himself. Yeah. Right? He is the way. And he say, he's telling this to his disciples. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Later in, in chapter 14, he tells them, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works will they do, because I am going to Amen. the Father. Amen. Think of Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. After Elijah goes and anoints Elisha, and begins to disciple Elisha, and spends a time with him, Elijah knows he's about to be taken up, and he asks Elisha, what do you want from me? Ask whatever you want. And Elisha asks for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Yeah. A double portion, greater works. And chariots of fire came and picked up Elijah. And as he was lifted up, Elijah saw him and said, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel. It's crazy. Greater works. So Elijah, Elisha was given a double portion because yeah. the cloak of Elijah fell on him. Power. A cloak symbolizes power. Think of Jesus and the woman that reaches to touch his robe. Yeah. Power came upon him. Yeah. Later, chapter 14 talks about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling them. In verse 15, I will ask the Father, 16, sorry, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, Amen. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. See, this is all coming before chapter 15. In verse 19, He says, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. Yeah. Because the vine is providing for you, if you receive this, you also will live. With this in mind, Jesus saying, I am the way, we arrive in chapter 15. Yeah. Where now he's talking about a tree, a vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. Yeah. He said, I am the way. So the way back to the tree of life is Jesus. Yeah. And we are one with him. Right? Yeah. We are the body of Christ. We are the church of Christ. Yeah. And so the tree of life in Jesus, his body bearing his branches so that others may enter in. Do you see this? Amen. Okay? The tree of life, the way to the tree of life is through him. And those who are eating of him become one with him, part of him, and begin to bear the fruit that others may enter in and eat. The way back to the tree of life is through Jesus Christ and his body, yeah. which is the church, Amen. which is you. Yep. You are to bear the fruit that God is producing for the body to eat and for the nations to eat. Yes. We yeah. can now begin to think of Matthew 28, where he says, go and make disciples of all nations. He told the disciples, you go and bear the fruit that I put in you. You stay with me. I've given you the Holy Spirit. Go and bear this fruit. That the entire world can eat from your fruit. Amen. That you are bearing. Amen. Because you are one with me. And this is the way back to the tree of life. Yeah. And so the call for us church is to eat and to drink yeah. and to abide. Yeah. He will produce the fruit. He will. We will bear the fruit that he is producing in us. If we stay in him. Yeah. If we receive from what he's given us. Amen. And so. I believe we're going to worship some. Yeah, worship. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Is this too much church? Yeah. Or you want to receive more? Amen. Because God has more to give. Amen. So we want to drink from the, from the water of the spirit. And we want to eat from his fruit. Amen. And we want to become one with him so that we can be a tree of life Amen. for others to eat. Come on.